are kind of hard. Anyway, let's talk about this. Am I screen sharing? I think I am. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. This network here. You got to find the equivalent capacitance of this network. Now, what I taught to you back when we went over this is that you got to go through, when you go through the network, you work on the innermost the innermost combo and you work your way out. So I'm gonna very carefully describe what's going on here. You have a six microfarad capacitor and a nine microfarad capacitor in series with a network, right? So you have a series, that's your, that's your outermost Combo, a series, six, that middle network, and the nine. Now we go to the middle network. The three microfarad and the 11 microfarad are parallel to the series combo on the right. So that's the second level. And then we have to deal with the series combo, which is the third and innermost level. The 12 and the six need to combine as a series. When you combine the 12 and the 6, you get an equivalent 4. Then you combine the 3, 11, and the 4 as a parallel configuration. You add them up, you get an 18. Then you deal with the final series configuration, the 6, the 18, and the 9. You add the inverses up, take the inverse, you get a 3 microfarad capacitor. So that's the idea of how you approach that problem. Okay, There are three combos here. Three combos. Now, let me tell you what some people mess up here. Some people want to do this. Some people want to take the 311 and the 12 and say, ooh, that looks like it's all in parallel. Let's combine these together. But you can't do that because the capacitors need to be individual. The 3 is by itself, the 11 is by itself, but the 12 is not by itself. 12 has something going on with that. The six are not connected to the other two. So you can't combine the three and 11 and the 12 together. Similarly, similar, similar, similarly, similarly, you can't combine the six and the 11 and the, and the nine outright because of the same deal. The 11 is not by itself. It exists in a combo with other things. So that's what you're trying to do there, is that. Okay, great. Let's move on to number three. Number three, what are the charge on and the potential difference across each capacitor? Excellent question, fantastic question, fun question, right? So what, we, what do we have here? We have the first layer is a series configuration. The two microfarad is in series with the parallel combo. So then we go one level down and we get the parallel combo. You combine that together, which would be, I don't know, 16 or something, right? Because they're parallel, you add it up. And then you deal with the final one, which is the series, and you do the additive inverses, take the inverse of that. We end up with a nice 16 over nine microfarad equivalent capacitance. Now, notice how I drew pictures. I drew the original circuit, then I redrew it after I did the innermost combo, and then I redrew it a third time once I had the equivalent. Now, that's a nice thing to do. The reason why it's a nice thing to do is because when you're asked to find the charge and the potential difference, you then work backwards. We now know, we know that this capacitor on the far right here is at nine volts because it's connected to the battery. We've already determined its uh, equivalent capacitance. And so then you just need to figure out what the charge is. You use your capacitor equation to do that. Now that we have that charge, now we walk backwards to the second one. Because of the series configuration, these capacitors have the same charge as the equivalent one did. Great. We know their capacitances, we know their, their charges, and then you work out what their voltages are. 
and they go proportionally. If you notice, we have a 16 here and a two on the bottom. That's a one to eight ratio. So guess what your voltages are gonna be? A one to eight ratio. Okay, one to eight ratio there. So um, the one up top of the larger capacitance, because look, the relationship between the capacitance and the voltage is there's an inverse relationship there. So that means the one with the larger capacitance will have the smallest voltage. That will be the one. This one uh, at the bottom here will be an eight. Okay, now we go back to the final picture and we know that the capacitances at the top here, right, have eight volts. Uh, sorry, one volt, I didn't mean it. One volt on them because they're in parallel. They, they share that, they don't share the voltage, they have the same voltage, right? And so with the one volt that you have here, you then use the capacitor equation again to determine the amount of charge on them because the amount of charge that we got way back here for the for the equivalent 12 one, not, it says, it says why does it say 12 there? It shouldn't say 12. But the equivalent over here, oh, it's because I it's the equivalent of one and two. It's not, it's not meant to be a 12. That was confusing. Uh, and then these, the charges on these two are going to be shared. They're going to share the charge that's on the equivalent one. Excellent. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the, the, the fourth one here a lot just because it's long and everything. And, you, and I'm going to encourage you to get in my webpage there and check a solution. But what I did is this. Okay, here, check this out. I'm going to go through this kind of fast here just because I don't have a lot of time, but this is a crazy combo, right? The innermost combo is a series configuration. The three C1s on the right, that's the innermost stuff. That gets combined, which is in parallel with C2. That's in series with the C1s on top and bottom, which is in parallel to the C2, which is now in series to the C1s on top and bottom again. So what I did is I every time I combined a combo, I read you the picture, read you the picture, read you the picture, read you the picture, read you the picture. And once I determine the voltage and the charge on this bad boy right here, I walk backwards and I fill out all the information in each step until I get to where I need to. And then I, I need to get back to CD. At that point, you're done. You can keep going if you want to, but... But that's the idea, okay? So that's all I'm gonna say about these because I don't have a ton of time. The ideas we developed on Monday was uh, electron current, which is our more modern perspective on how current works. Unfortunately, as I've previously mentioned, the standard convention for how we deal with current is a very old system that was before the knowledge of electrons and atoms existed. And because it's in such widespread use and it's so commonplace in all throughout, you know, science, we still use it today, unfortunately. What's different is that instead of talking about an electron current, we talk about, um, we talk about a charge current. So we are dealing with, instead of electron current, number of electrons per second, we're dealing with charge current, which is coulombs per second. Coulombs per second. Now, we don't call it charge current though. We just call it current, okay? And unfortunately, the way the convention works, it's the flow of positive charge. It's the flow of positive charge. And so Mr. Benjamin Franklin, who apparently is the person who developed the ideas of, of using positive and negative, well, he put the positives on the positives. He should have put the positives on the negatives because then everything would mesh up. But he didn't. So we're all suffering from that. Yes, I am recording right now. Okay. So the definition of current, which is given by a capital I, is the rate of change of charge per time. It's a rate, it's a derivative, fundamentally a derivative. And so this can be applied in a lot of different ways. When we talk about, you know, a wire, for example, this is the rate at which charge moves through a particular cross-sectional area. For example, you could say that. We do have a special unit for current. Uh, this definition yields coulombs per second, and we have a name for that. It is called the ampere after Fred Ampere, the very famous 
mathematician from the 1980s. No, I'm just joking. His name's not Fred. I don't know what his name is. Charles, probably. That's an old name. Frederick. That's an old name. Ampere sounds French. So Jacques. Let's go with the Jacques Ampere. Jacques Ampere did something in physics. I don't, I actually, sorry, I don't even know what he did. Uh, I'm not up on my physics history as it, when it goes back like two or 300 years. I just, I like the more recent stuff anyway. Uh, it's given by an A, okay? Uh, and that's, uh, that we usually refer to this as an amp, amp, right? Now there is a relationship between these two quantities, right? If we have numbers of electrons per second, well, it's very easy to convert that to charge by multiplying by the fundamental charge. So there is a relationship. I is equal to E times lowercase i. So all the equations that we previously developed for electron current now work perfectly fine. We just multiply them by E and boom, there we go. We got our charge current. The one thing to be aware of though is that charge current travels in the opposite direction though. All right, so question for you here off the bat. Every minute, 120 coulombs of charge flow through this cross-sectional layer of the wire. What would the current be? What would the current be? Okay, so the answer is D, two Jacques Ampères, two Jacques Ampères. His name is actually Andre Marie Ampère. Andre Ampere. So, Andre, two Andres. He's got two Andres in here. Good for him. All right. So this is what I was mentioning earlier, is that um, the one thing that is different about this compared to electron current is that electrons flow against the electric field and positive charge flows with the electric field. So pay very close attention to this picture here. The motion of the electrons is opposite the motion of current. Because remember, the current is defined as the motion of positive charges, positive charges. So that is opposite here. So in the figure that we've talked about previously with the capacitors, the electrons were able to flow counterclockwise. Uh, relative to this picture. The current flows like the clock. Okay, there we go. All right, question for you here. This is more of a what do you think kind of thing because we haven't really discussed this. We got a battery hooked up to two incandescent bulbs, it looks like, or birthday cakes with candles inside of them. Maybe, they kind of look like that. Um, a and B are identical light bulbs. Which light bulb will be brighter in this picture here? A lot of you are saying C, and C would be right, although we got a Z up in here, I'm not sure what that means, but. Z is okay too, I guess. C is the correct answer, and this is a very important thing to recognize here. Ooh, fancy. Um, Let's say the answer was A. Now, the implication here is that the brightness of the bulbs is proportional to the current. That is true. That is true. More current, brighter light. I don't think that's stretched to believe. Although you may be surprised, it's not a direct proportion. It's not a direct proportion, actually. Crazy. I know. Um... But let's consider if A is brighter than B, right? Because a misconception a lot of students have is that as the current uh, you know, flows because of the being connected to the battery, that it gets used up or something. And that is not true. Um, there are three really fundamental um, three really, really, really fundamental principles in physics. And that's conservation of mass, charge, and angular momentum. Those three things. Everything else ultimately is derived from those in terms of other conservations, like conservation of energy is really a statement about conservation of other things. 
The conservation of current is a very key thing. You can't get rid of it. So when the current flows through here, the current that flows through A must be the same as the current that flows through B. If it was not the same, okay, then say, for example, you said A was brighter than B, implying that there's less current that flows through B. That's a problem because that is what we would refer to as a sink. The charge is going somewhere. Where is it going? If it's going through A and the same stuff doesn't go through B, we have a problem. We have a problem. So we're not using up electrons. We're not using up any kind of charge here. Um, you know, for example, if we were to connect one bulb and compare that to this, well, that's different because those are different circuits. We'll get into that stuff later on. Do, 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 do. Although these light bulbs, you wouldn't even see them pop on. Remember what we said about these capacitors? A nanosecond. Did we say nanosecond or did we say, what was that number? Oh, the number was the, uh, was the mean time between collisions is I'm still I'm still tripped out about that mean time between collisions being femnoseconds. I don't I read a little research on that. I really couldn't come up with anything. I just find it hard to believe. All right. So <clears throat> a very important principle that we'll talk quite a bit about when we analyze our circuits is the conservation of current. The current at all points in a wire it's got to be the same. The current is always the same along one particular section of wire. Uh, something that we'll see a little bit later on, maybe today, that kind of directly comes from this is that if there is a branch, for example, say, for example, um, your current, let me see here. Let's make it like that. Yeah. So say, for example, you got a branch that goes out this way and then a branch that goes out this way. So the current comes in, the wire splits. Well, the, well, the current that comes in and the currents that leave here, you know, they got to ultimately add up, you know, to be the same, right? Because, I mean, if, if you had more current or less current coming out of the branches here, then the conservation of current's not being applied. So we would say that I equals, I don't know, like I1 plus I2. Where this is one and that's two, you know, something like that. Okay. Oh, we have another concept here called current density. Now, the word density, you know, uh, is always some sort of per unit distance or distances. Doesn't always have to be volume, by the way, right? Because you saw linear charge densities and surface densities and things like that. So in the context here, we're interested in how electrons flow through a wire. So we're interested in a cross-sectional area. And so J is the current density, which is defined as... I over A, okay? Now this quantity can be different in different sections of a wire because you can vary A. You can't vary I, but A can vary, right? And so what we have here, just to be clear about what we're doing here, because you see this equation, you're like, well, what is, what is going on here? How do we get this? Well, remember we talked about before that the electron current is given as NE VD times A. That's what we did last week. Well, if I'm going to include, if I'm going to change the current here, the electron current to charge current, I'll need to multiply by an E. So if I multiply both sides of this equation by the fundamental charge, the left side becomes an I. And then the right side has an extra um, fundamental charge in there. Divide this by A, and that's what J is equal to. 
So the electron current is a nice quantity because it's independent of the size of the wire. It's still a material dependent quantity, but it's sometimes nicer to talk about that because it doesn't depend on the cross section. Okay. It's a per unit cross section, you know. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Let's keep going. All right. What is the current density in this wire? What's you, what do you all have to say? B's and D's. B's and D's. What's the difference between B and D? Uh oh. Uh oh. People don't know how to convert their units. I don't know. I'm thinking it's B. Hope I'm right. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. You know, here's the thing. People always get a little tripped up by this, but the conversion between, I don't know if this was an issue for you, but, um, you know, a thousand millimeters, right? It's one meter. But that's for a linear unit. This is a squared unit, right? So 10 to the uh to 10 to the three right you simply got to square this stuff to see what the conversion is for that so this is actually 10 to the six millimeters squared equals one meter squared so for every dimension you have to convert you have to convert every dimension right so this is actually 10 to the six amazing if you got it right, great. If you didn't get it right, well, you'll learn something. So that's great too. Everybody's learning right now. Everybody's learned or is learning. So that makes me happy. All right, we got two segments of wire here. As you can see, segment two is a much larger segment than segment one. We want to know how the current in segment one compares to the current in segment two. What do you think about this? Letter in the chat. Let me know what you think smash that letter button, whatever the letter button you want to smash. It's like everybody's saying B. Everybody's saying B. Hmm. I don't know if I agree with B. I think it's, I think it's actually D. Ah, oh, damn. It's B. It is B. Oops. Mm -hmm. All right. No. Yeah. Uh, conservation of current. Simple enough. Yeah. Whatever current goes into one, the same has to go into two. Again, the argument is if it's not equal, we have a source or a sink. A source or a sink. And we don't want sources or sinks when we have conservation. Same question. What's up with the current density, however? Let me know what you think about this letter in the chat. A's, huh? Fantastic, right? You have a smaller area in section one. That would give you a larger current density. Excellent. All right. So. What we want to do now is the following. We have, there's a lot of equations right here, but here's what we developed previously. The, um, sorry. Uh, we have J as being N E E V D, right? Uh, electron current, uh, N E. There's a E in here, there's an M, there's an area, there's a tau, and there's an E. Okay. All right, um, so we gotta, we gotta juggle some stuff here. I'm gonna change this, remember we change this to an E, right? And that becomes I, and then we gotta throw another E over here. And then we're gonna divide this by A, and if I divide it by A, we end up with the stuff that you see uh, right over here. So let me box this though, right there. There we go. There we go. And that, ladies and gentlemen, 
is a new quantity. Now, you might remember in the last lecture, right? I talked about how we really want the connection between current and electric field. But the only issue we had last time is we have all these numbers, all these material dependent quantities in here, which we would hope can be, you know, turned around into something that's just much more easier to do. Well, if we invoke this idea of current density, right, uh, then we can rewrite our relationships to be this nice simple thing down here, which is J equals sigma E. Sigma is what's called the conductivity of the material that's being used to conduct the current. All right, <clears throat> so the conductivity is a very nice quantity. It includes all of our material dependent things into one quantity, right? So that's nice. Now we invoke J instead of I because there is still that cross-sectional area which is kind of a material dependent quantity. I mean, you can adjust the size of your wire, obviously. So you can change that more than you can change the material properties of something because all these things here are material properties. So that's fantastic. That's a very, very nice, simple quantity we're working with here. Now, in other contexts, we may not actually be interested in how well a material conducts electricity. Sometimes we actually care about the insulator properties, right? The insulator properties, which uh, the inverse of this quantity is what we call the resistivity. And it's just, it's the inverse, just the reciprocal. And um, this, this is a useful quantity if we want to know how poorly something conducts electricity, right? We don't make wires out of styrofoam because its resistivity is uh, crazy high. I believe is the is the SI prefix, crazy high, very high. Okay, let's get rid of these annotations here. Yeah, there's some there's some fire going on, man. There's a lot of smoke out there. <sighs> it's too bad. I'd like to drive and check it out, but oh well. I'm stuck here teaching teaching you folks. No, I'm not leaving my house. As soon as I walk outside, the virus shows up like tries to get in my nose. That's what I've been told. All right, so this is textbook values for resistivity and conductivity. Your textbook has similar values. These aren't the values from your textbook, but they're not too different. Uh, the only thing I will say is do not attempt to look up values online. Don't do that because they're all over the place. All over the place. And, and we're not being engineers right now. We're just learning the basic principles behind these things. So whether you use these values in the slides or the values in your textbook, they're not very different from each other. So it's fine to use both. Okay. As you can see here, if your resistivities are high, maybe not a great idea for using them for electricity, right? We don't use iron much for wires. That wouldn't be very good because they would heat the heck up. That's what they would do. Copper is very low. That's good. The resistivity is very low on those. Uh, the, of course, the conductivity is very high on those. Okay. Silver is good, although that's a little expensive, right? Nichrome's nice, but chromium is not exactly cheap. So tungsten's on here. You know what tungsten's used for, right? Light bulbs, at least the old, old style light bulbs, carbon and tungsten are used for your traditional incandescent bulbs. The filament that you see inside those are made up of tungsten. And tungsten's, uh, it's nice to use tungsten. It's not as brittle as carbon. It's a little more malleable. And you can see its resistivity is a bit higher. So when you put a current through it, it freaks out a lot more than carbon does. Yeah. Okay, question for you here. I really need my water, so I'm gonna leave you to read this and I'll be back in one minute. 10 people, come on, don't be lazy everybody. Get some letters in here. Put down the video game, wake up, turn off Netflix, get some letters up in here. The answer is A, why? Because when we answered this for J, it was A and they're directly 
related to each other. So this is interesting because our electric field, right, is going to change in the different areas because the areas are different. Electric fields are going to change. That's strange, actually. It seems strange, at least, uh, because the current is constant, but the electric field changes? It seems weird, but um, it is correct. Okay. All right, let's do it. Millimeter diameter wire. Darn it! Keep they keep doing this to us. We don't want millimeters. We don't want diameters. One point five times ten to the minus three uh, meters for a radius. Now I read the rest of the problem. Wire carries twelve amps. That's big. Twelve amps, pretty big. When the electrical field is point zero eight five, what's the wire's resistivity? All right, this is pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, if you want to use resistivity, we use J equals E over rho, all right? Solve for, well, we got to put J, we don't have J, right? We got to put that in terms of current in area. We solve for rho, we get A, E over I. We put our numbers in, we get 5 times 10 to the minus 8, I believe that says. I'm sorry, it's so small. 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 2, that works out. That does work out. So 10 to the minus 5 times 10 to the minus 8. Now, look at these units here. Ohms times meters. Now you're looking at saying, what is that? What's the what what's the what's the ohms here? Well, I'll tell you later. Okay. Just just know it, it's a thing right now. And I say later, I mean like give me 15 minutes. A 0.5 millimeter diameter wa silver wire. Uh-oh, we don't want that. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. Silver wire. Ah. You're told the material. Okay, you got to keep that in mind. When you see the material, you go back to your figures, all right, uh, to your tables and look up the value. We got a little tiny current, a little tiny 20 milliamp current. What is the electric field and electron drift speed? Ooh, we got to go back a bit here. Electric field, let's see here. We can get the electric field from the current density because we have that. And we have that it's silver, so we know what our conductivity or resistivity is. And so I put that stuff together here. Uh, the electron, sorry, the uh, current density is I over A. We can solve this for um, E. So we got a current on top. I have to look up my value for the conductivity of silver, 6.2 times 10 to the seven. It's pretty high. Put in our area. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 is our electric field. And then for the electron drift speed, we're going to have to go back a bit to our old equations. And this equation, we have our electron uh, current equation, which you can turn into the charge current by multiplying both sides by E. And we know all that stuff. So we solve for VD, and we get a drift speed of, uh-oh, I can't read it. can't read it because Adobe's in the way. 1.1 times 10 to the minus 5. Very slow. Very, very slow. All right. So, you know, these problems here, not too challenging, to be honest. I mean, the, the, there's kind of three things to keep in mind here. You know, when you're dealing with your areas, use radius, right? Use meters. Don't be a weirdo when you use the diameter formula. Um, keep in mind of the material being used. Right? And... Um, you have a lot of little equations. Just you have to make sure you juggle all those equations appropriately. So a lot of things to keep in mind. A lot of equations. Excellent. Excellent. Let's keep going. All right, I mentioned this a little earlier in the lecture. This directly comes from conservation of current. But if we have a junction, that's what I meant to say earlier. I didn't say that. Um, that the currents going in must equal the currents going out. Again, if this was not true, conservation of current would not exist. Question for you here, current in the fourth wire is what? What do we got? Two going in, five going in. So we got seven in, we got nine out. Well, we gotta have another two in. Two to the left, gotta be D, it's gotta be D. It is D. Excellent. Okay. No, there's definitely smoke out there. There's smoke. A 
Although although the smoke is blowing to the west, that's kind of not normal, is it? There's like no wind out there too. Something's weird. I must be asleep right now, which would really make me mad because I have to teach this class again. It's one thing I hate about dreams. I wake up and I'm like, I gotta do that all over again. All right. So the figure here, now here's what we're trying to do to, to wrap this up. We're trying to make, we got our electric field stuff and we're very happy with our electric field. We're very pleased that we have an electric field to work with. However, we've spent a long time we spent a long time um, developing this idea of potential because it's really the most practical thing we deal with here. So we want to connect this, these ideas up to potential. So the electric field that is established inside the wire that can be expressed as a uh, in terms of potential, the change in the potential uh, divided by a, a, a distance across which the potential exists is what our electric field is. So if we consider a, a section of wire, right, a section of wire, uh, then that's going to be given by delta V over L. Now you say, well, wait a minute, something silly, something's a little silly about this relationship here. There's no negative sign. Okay, fine, there's no negative sign, but negative signs are really only there to indicate direction or drop in potential. And uh, the conventions that we usually develop for this stuff, um, that's built into the delta V. It's built into the delta V. So we don't put a negative sign on the front here. I know that's confusing. We should just have it there. Trust me, when we start analyzing circuits, it's better to just consider delta V being positive or negative based on what's going on in your circuit. You know. And then you say, well, wasn't this supposed to be an integral? That's true, it was an integral. However, um, the electric field that's established inside here is, a, is a basically a constant. It is a constant, it doesn't, doesn't change. So the integral does just turn into this really simple differential, or you can rewrite it as a simple differential, I should say. Right. So um, we can rewrite what our electric field is in terms of the things we know, right? Uh, J is I over A which is also equal to E over P, P being the resistivity. We uh, combine these relationships together and we end up with this quantity at the bottom here. Now we spent a lot of Monday and a lot of today to really do, well, to do a lot of things, right? I mean, you know, I'm teaching you about the fundamentals of what it means for a current to exist. But a lot of our work has been leading up to this one moment. And this one moment is the derivation of this equation right here. This is the pinnacle of our discussions here. This tells us exactly how a potential difference across a wire, across anything really, that uh, can allow current to flow, how that translates into actual charge flow. That's pretty crazy, to be honest. That's wild, right? I mean, because like, think about the more abstract ideas we've been talking about, right? Potential difference was always a statement about energy, you know, charges move through there and they can speed up or whatever. And there's always this implication of motion, right? Because we're dealing with energy. And then current is exactly that. It's the motion of charge. And now we've linked these two ideas together now. That the potential difference that's established, typically by the battery or whatever it could be, will produce a current in a substance. Now the A over rho L is all material dependent things. So intrinsic material properties are all stored in rho. And how the wire is constructed is an A and an L, right? So that's that's kind of what we did. Now, we have a name. This is so special. This is so special and dear to us that we have ascended it to 
have its own special quantity, unit, and equation with a name that has been uh, elevated to the status of a law, right? Okay, so we're now, come on. Yeah, these things work too well. I don't want the water to be this dang cold. It's ridiculous. All right, so that quantity, rho L over A, is all grouped together. And this is the last time we're doing this. I know we just keep shoving things and other things here and alter the expression for R is, you know, if you write it all out in terms of its stuff, it's pretty wild. But this is what's known as the resistance. Okay, the resistance. And it's given in this unit of the ohm. The ohm is defined as one volt over one Andre, right? Andre Ampere, as I've learned today. One ohm. This is a capital omega. That's the symbol here for the ohm. Okay. And so we can now rewrite this in terms of the very familiar quantity we have here. And this is known as Ohm's Law. After Mr. or Mrs. Ohm, I'm learning things myself today here. Who is Ohm? Who is Ohm? Gregor Ohm. Love that name. Gregor Ohm. Great name after Gregor Ohm. So he did something well. Him and his buddy Ampere, along with their friend Volt, has came up with all this stuff. Now, let me say a few things about this equation to uh, um, dispel a lot of issues. Now, some of you may have experience with this equation through, you know, other things you may have done. For example, it's not too uncommon that I get a student rolling through here that's been in robotics since they were, you know, like two months old. And like circuits are like, you know, a joke to them. And, uh, you know, if you're in that boat, well, congrats. This class is going to be pretty easy for the next two or three weeks. But because um, I had a guy like that a, about a year or two ago, Wyatt. You guys, everybody knew Wyatt. That dude put me to shame. Dude, he knew his circuits like crazy. He showed me this most crazy stuff. I have no idea what he was doing. He, he knew circuits way easy. And so what happened is we have had labs. And then his group would be done in like a half an hour because <laughs> they would just rip through it because he just knew everything. Oh, well, you know, good for him. Um, but so if, you know, if you're in that situation, well, congrats. Otherwise, if you have a vague knowledge of this stuff, let me clear up some things for you because the way we talk about this kind of stuff in physics is very different than the way it's discussed in, say, engineering or even even like – I've had straight up electricians take this class, you know, and they're, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about here. They say hot wires. I say potential difference. I say positive terminal and we're all speaking different languages here. So anyway, so with this equation, a few things I want to keep note of here. This equation, notice I put a delta V in here. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times you see just a V in here. And that can be confusing because if for this class, V means electric potential, where delta V means voltage. Those are very different from each other, right? So I always make sure I put the delta V on this stuff just so it's very clear what we're doing. I don't, I don't, I don't want you to use just V in there, okay? Just because at this level, I don't know how much you know right now. I don't know if you know it's potential difference or if it's electric potential by itself or what, okay? A second thing I'm gonna say about this, there's a lot of ways you see this equation. This is, I like the way it's written like this, even though it's not too different than write it like this. I R equals delta V. Now here's the problem with writing things like I R equals delta V. A lot of people think about this equation backwards. They say, oh, well, the current going through this wire uh, uh, establishes this potential difference. That's wrong. That's completely wrong. 
the way it's the way it's uh, specified at the bottom of the slide here is very nice because what this equation tells you is this what kind of current can be established with this potential difference put across this particular material okay the potential difference exists externally and then we have an element a circuit element wire, whatever you want to call it, that will experience a potential difference. And as a result, current can flow through it. And Ohm's law is telling you what the current is. And that's the main purpose of Ohm's law, is to tell you, to communicate to you, what, how current is made. How current is made, okay? So anyway. Question for you here. Wire two is twice the length and twice the diameter of wire one. What is the ratio of their resistances? What's the ratio of their resistances? Okay, so you may want to remember this quantity here. I'll rewrite it. Right down here are rho L over A. Look at that rho, that's a great rho. I'm very pleased with that rho. It's got a little, little, uh, the tail of it's a little funny, but it's an okay row. It's B. Now, let's talk about this in two ways. Mathematically, it's B, right? Because mathematically, here's what we're working with here. You got wire two, which is row 2L over, you know, 4A, right? It's 4A because A is squared, right? And then your R1 is just this. When you cancel things out, you get a half. So mathematically, it's a half, right? But conceptually, what's going on here? If you have a thicker wire, well, a thicker wire is much more profound than a longer wire, right? Because area squared. But it's saying here that the resistance is going to go down by a half. And that makes sense because you could obviously have more charge flow through here because you have a thicker wire. That's it. And if you look at Ohm's law, remember Ohm's law says, you know, how do you get current to go through this stuff? Oh my goodness, let's not do that right now. Zoom. I delta V over R. I mean, just conceptually, what do you think would be bet what do you think would be easier to put a current through or how could you generate more current well more surface area is you know more charge can flow through there that makes sense it makes sense and from a conceptual standpoint all right so we got a battery hooked up to a wire just that's it just wire by itself that's it battery hooked up to it the battery establishes a potential difference, right? And that wire is made of some material, has some length, has some cross-sectional area, so it can be uh, described in terms of its resistance. And so the current that's generated in this wire would be given by the potential difference across the wire, which would be the same as the battery, right? Do the loop law and divided by the resistance of the wire here. So the current we're describing here is the current that flows through the wire, okay? Now, notice what the notation is down here. It says delta V wire over R. We didn't say delta V battery, but they are the same. They are the same. They happen to be the same, but they won't always be the same. And so what happens is charge is gonna flow, positive charge will flow here clockwise. We know what's really going on, right? It's the electrons going the other way. And uh, we're seeing a drop in potential as we go through here. And that's ultimately why the electric field's established, which causes the current. Okay. Great. Now, <clears throat> the relationship between I and delta V um, so if you treat delta V as, you know, like a, like a variable here, then, uh, you know, you have a linear relationship. 
and the slope of the line is, is, is well, one over the slope of the line, I guess, because the equation would look like this. If you imagine this is like y is mx, right? This is like, you know, i is... Oh, sh so the slope is one over R and anything, any kind of substance that does have its current linearly increase with potential like this is referred to as, uh, ohmic, the materials ohmic, um, because this doesn't always happen. This is what we came up with, assuming that, you know, everything works the way it's supposed to. But things that are non-ohmic are simply things that do not obey this relationship. Now, what things wouldn't obey this relationship? Well, if you heat up a wire a lot, right, what happens to a wire if it heats up a lot? Well, it could increase in size, right, due to thermal expansion. That would change the value of R. And so it wouldn't be linear anymore. Um, I mean, you could have really wild things happen. What if you heat up your copper wire and it starts to melt? Well, that's not going to be ohmic anymore. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a mild point here, but you know, this isn't, this is this, this is a law under the circumstances by which it's obeyed. If you have really extreme conditions, right? If you heat up something a lot, if your current gets extremely high. Eh, then you might get some non-omic behavior. It's true of everything, you know. All right. What are we doing on time? Little crunch, a little bit of a time crunch. I'll get through it, though. Current through a wire is measured as the potential difference is varied. What is the wire's resistance? What is the resistance here? Uh, don't put a letter in. This is pretty simple. I, I want to get through the rest of this. So the slope of this line looks like to be 50. So the inverse of the slope would be 0 0.02. The answer is B. Great. All right. Now, what is typically more interesting for us is not our wire. Having a wire hooked up to a battery by itself is not very helpful. Because wires, generally speaking, don't have a ton of resistance. We don't want them to have a ton of resistance. We want to be able to pull a lot of energy. We want to be able to pull a lot of current from our battery. So the wires are usually made in such a way they don't do that. What happens is we have circuit elements that provide a greater resistance. They have a job to perform. It could be a light bulb or something like that. And those elements have usually a much larger resistance than the wires itself. So here we would consider, you know, what's the potential drop across the resistor. In fact, if I had a resistor, now the resistor is just a general term to describe anything that establishes a significant potential difference across it. I mean, you could, we have devices that are that strictly do that, that, that they don't have any job other than just produce a resistance. And those are more specifically what resistors are, but anything that draws power uh, it's going to be a resistor, a light bulb, right? That's a, technically a resistor. So what happens is you kind of have a series configuration here. You got the wire on top, you got your resistor, and you got your wire on the bottom, right? So that's a series configuration there. So there'd be a little bit of drop across the wire, then a huge drop across the resistor, and then the rest of it's a drop across the wire. We loop back around, we get a delta V of zero. That is true. However we are going to be working with ideal wires. And the ideal wires are simply the assumption that the wires have no resistance to them. And so there isn't any significant potential drop across them. So it's just the resistor is basically taking all of that potential difference. It's not a realistic situation, but the amount of resistance that wires actually have is incredibly small. And making an ideal wire approximation is valid. Very valid, by the way. All right, well, somehow I did finish this stuff up on time. Let's go ahead and do these last questions here before I done. 
The electric field inside a 30 centimeter long copper wire is five millivolts per meter. What's the potential difference between the ends of the wire? Well, again, you're juggling a lot of equations here. We wanna find potential difference. We gotta just dig through all those equations and find the one that contains the parameters that we know. We know the electric field here, and we know the distance, the length of the copper wire. So this is a pretty straightforward problem, actually. E equals delta V over L. Solve for delta V. Make sure you put things in meters. That is millivolts, so it gets a 10 to the minus three on there, and we got our answer. Uh, the other one is a 10 meter long wire with a diameter 0.8 millimeters. Therefore, it has a radius of four times 10 to the minus four meters. Has a resistance of 1.1 ohms. What is the material made of? What you're gonna wanna do here is solve for some quantity that exists in the tables that we've seen so far. And I decided to go with the one that had resistivity in it. I could have done a lot of things, but that seemed to be the most direct way to go about it. You could look up conductivity. I mean, you could look up electron density, I suppose. That would be kind of a pain in the butt, but you could do that. In fact, could you really do that? I don't think you can here. We don't have enough information, I think. No, we do. Do we? No, you don't, because you need to know drift speed. And you know, like, no, so that wouldn't work anyway. This is, I think, is the only one that actually works. Put our numbers through here. We get a 5.5 to the minus 8, which is most closely resembles tungsten. Tungsten, capital W on the periodic table. 